Good morning to all of you, uh, whether you're watching us online or if you're here. We're glad to have you with us. Some of you are here for the first time, and so we just want to say hello and um, welcome to, to the Really Living Center where um, we believe in hope and wholeness. Good to see you. Good to see all of you. Just seeing a little bit Rebecca up front this morning reminds me of last Sabbath. We're kind of still on a high where Brady was baptized and Lydia and Phyllis were, did a profession of faith. I'm still, I'm still telling everybody about it, by the way. I just want you to know that. <laughs> My mom and dad, I must have told them 10 times this week. He was baptized. It's exciting. It's exciting. And there's more to come. Um, so yes, we are on, on a little book in the Old Testament called Daniel. Um, have you ever, <clears throat> have you ever started reading a book by reading the last chapter? Anybody's ever done that? Man, I thought, I didn't think there would be that many weird people in this church. <laughs> I used to do it a lot when I went to school because I had to, uh, I had to read a lot of scientific papers and I just read the conclusion because that basically tells you what they were researching at the time. Uh, but I have to confess that I rarely ever started the book uh, by reading uh, the last chapter. And I know I may be offending someone here who loves to read or loves to write. But uh, rest assured that this is not my practice except for today. Like I said, we're on a series from a little book in the Old Testament. So the Old Testament is the first part of the Bible, and then the New Testament is the second part. And the first part is before Jesus, and the last part is after Jesus, the Old and the New Testament. And there's a little book in there called Daniel, and it's basically labeled after the person who wrote it, or wrote most of it. He was a young Hebrew boy who, uh, from one day to the next... Because of his unwavering faith for God, became what I would consider the most influential man in the whole wide world that has ever lived. Why? Because I believe he was put in a place and in a time to be a messenger of God to save this world. That's how important this man is and was. And it's kind of a tall order for a teenager. Right? I see Ella looking down as I say that. Let's say, for example, that you were responsible to save the whole world with one message that you're going to share. Ouch. Ouch. And not only that, but you were taken away from your home. You were put, made into a slave, never to ever go back home again. That's Daniel. And today, we're going to talk about Daniel chapter 5. And I've entitled the sermon to measure up. So against my better judgment, I'm going to start with the end of the chapter. And I'm going to put it up on the screen. But if you do have your Bible with you, or if you have it on your device, you might as well open it up to Daniel chapter 5 because we're going to read the whole chapter in a little bit here. But I'm going to start with the end. And these are the words that are in the end of the chapter, near the end. It says, this is what these words mean. Mene means numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and has brought it to an end. Tekel means weighed. You have been weighed on the balances and you've not measured up. And parsina, or some Bibles say aparsin, means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And a little NLT at the bottom simply means the, from the New Living Translation. Some people don't know, so I'm just, you know, it's good for everybody to know. What's NLT? And the verse that really caught my attention in this part is verse 27. You have been weighed on the balances and you've not measured up. Or some Bible versions say you have been 
wanting. Have you ever felt like you just don't measure up? I remember, I don't know if I told this to you, Mom. My mom is here today, so you're going to get to figure some things about my life that you may not have known. She's like, oh, no, should I just leave now? <laughs> From grades one to four, I was in a public school, and um, the practice was that when we would go out for recess, we would play, do our thing, and then the teacher would blow the whistle, and we would all have to come back in line with our grade. And the line would always go from the smallest person to the tallest person. I, I don't know if they still do that today, but they shouldn't. Because I was always in the front. And there are some circumstances where it's nice to be in the front, but there are circumstances where it's not. Especially when you're in the front because of your height. Because of something about you that's different than other people. And every time that whistle will blow, I had to be in the front. Grades one to four. And then in grades five, I changed school. I don't know if you remember, we were taught by nuns in grades five and six. Uh, at that school that wasn't far from home, I could go and bike there. And of course, grade five, I was again, same practice, whistle blew and front line. Grade six, no one wants to be in the front of that line. You get to go to class first. Woohoo! <laughs> but to the front, I was relegated. And not just in the line, but also in the bus. I don't know if you guys understand the politics of riding a bus. There's politics there. If you sit in the back, you're cool. If you sit in the front, you're not cool. And I had to sit in the front. I was relegated to the front. All the days that I had to ride a bus, which wasn't too many years, so it wasn't too bad. Short people often get the short end of the stick. Roller coaster rides, you cannot ride unless you are this high, right? Go to Canada's Wonderland. Shay, you and I, we suffer, right? Yes. There's a lot of rides that we weren't able to get on for many more years than our friends. And you watch them go around and you're sitting there licking, licking your ice cream cone. And you're holding theirs and licking it too. <laughs> you're always the last one to be picked on the basketball court. Obviously, he can't play. He's too short. And when it comes to relationships, I figured that out pretty early on. I started looking around. And all the moms and dads who drove their friends to school, the mom was always shorter than the dad. And I started to figure out that I only have 50% of the population to pick from. The concept of not measuring up or being in want because something is missing is all too familiar for all societies in this world. From culture to culture, expectations are woven into the fabric of society and you must comply in order to be part of society. If you get 70% in your physics classes and you are an engineering student, you're going to be left wanting. If you don't put the extra work at your job and a new promotion comes up, there's a possibility that you may be passed by. You may be left wanting. If your group of friends hang out and they get into some behaviors, vaping or whatever it is that they do that you think you shouldn't do, and you decide to stand up and speak up against it, you will be left wanting. You will be missing out. But what about God? Do you feel that you measure up when it comes to God? Most people don't. Most Christians don't. But that's because religions today have made God someone who arbor arbitrarily thinks very little of us. 
They make God an entity to fear, one who will punish us if we don't listen and if we don't obey. And this morning, I hope to be able to set the record straight, Kiki. I'm going to set it straight for you, just for you. Come on, you got to come to church more often or else I'm going to point you out. <laughs> I love Kiki, I love Kiki. What do you have to do to measure up when it comes to God? That's the question. So we've learned from the last four chapters of Daniel, and if you haven't heard the previous sermons, uh, I would really recommend that you, you do it during the week sometime, and uh, you know, instead of just turning on YouTube for half an hour, maybe just watch it. Because it really builds up, right? But from the last chapters, four chapters of Daniel, that we figure out that God pursues us and will reveal his plan for our lives in whatever ways he can. For Nebuchadnezzar, it was dreams, interpretations of dreams by a little guy named Daniel who he didn't even know. Then a fiery furnace that people were thrown in and walked out, not even smelling like smoke to eventually having to eat grass like a cow for seven years. We called it lycanthropic insanity. Just listen to last week's sermon. It's actually a disease. But here in Daniel chapter 5, we have a different character altogether from Nebuchadnezzar. As a matter of fact, we know that... Um, Maybe, Caitlin, you can, you can confirm this or not. But we say that he was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Because the Bible says he was, Nebuchadnezzar was Belshazzar's father. But that's just the terms that they use in those days. He was actually the grandfather of Belshazzar. And Belshazzar is only mentioned once in the Bible. And the only thing that he's really known for is putting on really good parties. A lot of people liked him. A lot of people worshipped him and praised him because he put on good parties. And that's the only thing we know about him from the Bible. Almost the only thing. And what is even more interesting about this character is that God doesn't seem to have the same amount of patience with Belshazzar that he had with Nebuchadnezzar. And my question is, why? Doesn't God love everybody? Doesn't God show grace to everybody? Doesn't want God want to give everybody a chance? So what we know so far about Belshazzar, and that's my fault for starting at the end of the chapter, is that he was weighed in the balances and he didn't measure up and that his kingdom will be given to the Medes and the Persians and that his days were numbered, and that he would not reign for much longer. Let's find out why. Let's go to Daniel chapter 5. Let's go to Daniel chapter 5, and just read it along. Well, not out loud, but read it along with me as I go along. I'm reading from the, actually it's not the New Living here. This is another one, New King James Version. It says, Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. So there's a lot of people there. It's not a small party. It's not a backyard party. This is a party where all the leaders were invited to, all the important people. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and the silver vessels which his father, grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from those vessels. Then they brought the golden vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which has been in Jerusalem. And the kings and his lords and his wives, they drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed. 
And his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. In other words, he was afraid. I tried to look for a picture of somebody with their knees knocking together, but they were all royalty. I had to pay, so I said, forget it. I'm not paying for that. And the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. And he spoke, saying to the wise man of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Can anybody say déjà vu? Twice already this happened to his grandfather. He brought in all the wise people and helped me with this because I'm troubled, I can't sleep. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. I have a feeling that he knew that this was serious. I mean, come on. A hand appears. If a hand appeared right here and wrote something on the wall, I don't know, I'd, I'd be kind of interested, right? Something was not right. So then the queen shows up. Uh, the queen mother, it says, because of the words of the king and his lords, she came to the banquet hall, which means she wasn't there to begin with. And the queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of all the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And as much as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar, now let Daniel be called and he will give the interpretation. I just get the impression from this story that Daniel was no longer in charge of the magicians and the astrologers. He had been put aside. And you'll see why. Listen to this. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. And this is what the king said to Daniel. Are you the Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah? Whom my father king brought from Judah? Basically, he's reminding Daniel, you're a slave, right? I just want to make that clear. I'm the king, you're the slave. I have heard of you, that the spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought before me, that they should read this writing that you see right here, and that they tell me what it means. But they couldn't do it. And I have heard of you, that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now if you can read the writing, and you can make known to me its interpretation, I'm going to give you purple clothes, and I'm going to put a gold chain around you, around your neck, and you shall be the third ruler in my kingdom. Wow. Purple robe. And listen to Daniel, what he says. This is crazy. He answered and said before the king, let your gifts be to yourself and give your rewards to someone else. But yet, I'm going to tell you what this says and I'm going to tell you what it means. O king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty, glory, and honor. And because of all the majesty that he gave him, all the peoples and nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. Whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride... He was deposed from his throne, and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses." But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not 
humbled your heart, even though you knew everything that I just told you. And you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you. And you and your lords and your wives and your concubines, you've drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand owns all your ways. You have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and the writing was written, and this is the inscription that was written. What's on the screen? At some point in your life, each and every single one of us, whether we go to church or not, whether we believe in God or not, at some point in your life, you're going to have to make one of two decisions. It's a decision that nobody can make for you. Either you'll look up and give God his rightful place in your life. We talked about that last week. Or you'll ignore the obvious signs around you to fill the spiritual component of your psyche with God. See, we're, we're good at finding ways to take care of our physical needs. We go to the gym. We eat well. We're also good at filling our emotional needs. We'll hang out with friends that we like. We'll, we'll go w walk in nature to, to take the stress away from us. We'll stop rooting for the Montreal Canadiens. That will take away a lot of pain and sorrow. We also take care of our social needs. We go to restaurants. We play board games with friends. But what about our spiritual needs? For a lot of people, that component of their life has just been pushed aside. Some may even go as far as fighting it, much like Belshazzar did. And it seems that from this story, and if you know from the previous chapters we've read, that both God and Daniel really don't have much time for Belshazzar. But in reality, it also seems like Belshazzar doesn't have much time for God or for Daniel. But there really wasn't that much difference between Belshazzar and Nebuchadnezzar was there. Like father, like son. They both believe in magic and sorcery. They both ignored the existence of Daniel's God. They both defied, even once shown the power of God. They both ruled with despotism and revelry. Both did not measure up. But there is one distinct difference between the father and the son. Anybody want to take a stab at it? No, I didn't think so. Acknowledgement of God. And that's where it has to start for every single one of us. It can't be your mom's God. It can't be your friend's God or your pastor's God. God has to be yours and only then can you choose to write him off because God allows you to say no. He gives you that right, that freedom. But don't say no because somebody else told you to say no or because somebody else told you about God the way they see it. Find out for yourself because I believe that if you truly want to find out, you will. And I believe that you're going to find out that he's a good God. And I believe that to acknowledge God is the hardest of decision for some people. 
whether it's because you've been burnt by religious people or because you're turned off by their political positions, God forbid if I lived in the States, or because you feel judged by us, or it was shoved down your throat by a well-meaning parent or a friend or a Sabbath school teacher or a neighbor. I'm sorry if a religious person has given you the wrong image of God. We are awkward at best when it comes to beliefs, aren't we? But the fact still remains that you have to wrestle with the idea of God, of a powerful being beyond our limited knowledge and existence. Nebuchadnezzar had no idea that God existed, at least not a God that was better than his gods. But Belshazzar had knowledge of what happened to his grandfather, but he chose to ignore it. You are his successor, O Belshazzar, and you knew all of this, yet you have not humbled yourself. There's an expression that says, knowledge is bliss. Not everybody feels that way. I don't know what would change in your life if you decided to make God the authority or like it says here to humble yourself that's what it means I don't know what would change in your life if you chose to humble yourself and that's exactly the issue here too many religious people know exactly what you need to do I just wish sometimes we would just shut up and live it And yet, you look at us and you see that we're just as messed up as everybody else around the world. Rather, if we as human beings tried to lift each other up, I believe God would have a bigger place in our society. There would be less division. We've made religion a springboard for right and wrong when I believe that conversation only belongs to God. The Bible says He's the judge and he says to us, don't judge one another. And all God wants for you and all he wants for me is that we give him a chance. In short, that we humble ourselves. Because I believe that for some people to actually look, I mean, look at, look, look at, the, at Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Some of you may not know that story. He was a lead pastor in, in the religion of the Jews. And he actually had to meet Jesus as night. He was afraid of what everybody else would think. But it, praise the Lord that after Jesus died, Nicodemus humbled himself to the point where he didn't care what people thought anymore. He became a follower of Jesus. For Belshazzar, it was to admit that Daniel's God was the true God. But he did the unthinkable. At least, you know, in 575 B.C., he did the unthinkable. Which is actually what brought the end to his life and to his kingdom. He intentionally decided to put God to the test by taking something that was holy to God and to defile it and dedicate it to other gods. Gods of silver, gods of gold, gods of bronze, gods of stone, gods of wood. Does that remind you of anything, those metals? Daniel chapter 2, the statue and all those metals and how all their kingdoms would end. And here they take the vessels of God and they worship those gods. And it's interesting because the Bible specifically says gods that neither see nor hear nor know anything at all. We have gods today. They may not be made of stone. They may not be made of gold. But they're made of other things like how many albums they've sold. How many Super Bowls they've won. How many movies they've made. 
I know this because if they walk down a red carpet, there's millions of people screaming. Screaming at what? Well, you think she's going to turn around and say, thanks for the scream. I love you too. I always remember Joe Kidder, a, a, a pastor that I respect. He went to a baseball game and everybody was cheering. It was a home run. And he didn't understand. He says, all these people are cheering for a home run. He says, I just want to cheer because I love Jesus. That's all that matters to me. And all these people are cheering for a ball. And here I'm cheering for the one who saved my life. We've got gods in the wrong places, don't we? If you put your hopes in anything else but God, you will not measure up. That's the key. That's the key to this whole sermon. That's why God had no time for Belshazzar. Because to measure up has nothing to do with your behavior or your physical height, thank goodness, or how much you know. But rather, who you know. You see, Belshazzar's grandfather had a huge learning curve, but his life was a testimony to his own family. Nebuchadnezzar had a heart change and then a life change. You'll see this when we talk about Daniel chapter 7. Belshazzar's learning curve was much reduced because he had his grandfather's testimony. Even the queen mother... She knew. She came to him and said, I know someone who can interpret this for you. She wasn't at the party. And really at the end of the day, I really believe that God knew Belshazzar's heart. God knew that even though he had been given ample chance to look up, he never would. But this may not be the case for you. You're here, or you're listening to this sermon online, or on the podcast, because you want to give God a chance, or else you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be listening to this. And this is what you need to know in order to measure up. For this is how God loved the world. That he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have life everlasting. That's how you measure up. God sustains life. He doesn't take it. And if he did take it, because there's biblical evidence that he has taken it, it, isn't, it is after years and years and years of warning. God is life. He is not death. Without God, we are nothing. I know this, this, this just smacks the face of humanism. I know. But humanism is actually anti-grace. Because humanism is all about how we can save ourselves. And as far as I'm concerned, we haven't done a really good job at it. We are God's creative, intelligent design. We have a life with purpose. And as such, we do not have control of our own destiny or the destiny of this world. Because it tells us, doesn't it, in Daniel chapter 2, that after the ten toes, the stone is going to come down, smash the statue, and there will be an everlasting kingdom that is not created by man. Therefore, the more we hold on to this, to this place, the less we can hold on to God. That's just mathematically, logically makes sense. We have been delegated as keepers of this place, not as owners. 
So God prepared a plan in order to save this world from sin. It's a plan that caused him a lot of pain because he had to give his son to die in my place. Because the Bible says that the result of sin is death. And that is something that God said. Therefore, if God wants to save this world, he has to give up his son because he made the rule so that we can live, so that you can live. I know it's hard to believe and accept this. The Bible even says that it would be hard. In a book called 1 Corinthians, in chapter 1, verse 18, it says, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. The cross. Not this piece of wood that you hang on your neck, but what it symbolizes. It symbolizes giving up control for the sake of others. Man, do I love Jesus. And this is a message, even written in a little bit more detail in a book called Romans chapter 5, which is a book that was written by Paul who wrote to the people who lived in the city of Rome who were Christians amidst many, many people who weren't. And he says, for the sin of this one man, Adam, which was the first man that was created, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and His gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Through one man we have death, right? You have death, Colin. You, you, you deserve to die because of sin. We all do. But that is not, have, doesn't have to be our end goal. We can take the gift. And then we have to open it. And that gift is grace given to us through Jesus Christ. Which means that it is no longer Don who lives, but Christ who lives in you. He replaces you. And when God sees you, he sees Jesus. Because he died so you don't have to. Man. You see, God created this world without sin. And according to the amazing prophecy of Daniel chapter 2, he's going to recreate it again. Man listened to the lies of Satan and they lost their trust in God who gave all of this untainted earth to begin with. And here we are today. This is not the way earth looked in the Garden of Eden. The result of a well-crafted and time-tested deception by the one who knows that he has but a short time to make his last stand. I, I just want to be clear here that God did not create sin. Rather, it is our disobedience that has brought the millions of consequences that we live under today. And yet, this world still has this elements of God that makes it so beautiful and so meaningful. Yesterday I was in my office looking out the window and I saw the rabbit, our little rabbit, just this tiny little thing. It was so cute. There's so many beautiful things that God has still created. We still see his beautiful love and creativity everywhere we go. And God didn't leave us without a door, one that would allow us to measure up and not to be left wanting. And that door is grace. A grace and grace can only be experienced. And I've said this so many times. Grace can only be experienced when we realize that we messed up and that we need help. Otherwise, grace is, well, grace is for the weak. Because only people who admit they're weak will actually take grace. I find this interesting. Daniel's trust in God was tested in captivity. Nebuchadnezzar figured out God's grace the hard way and Belshazzar never even gave it a chance. And with all three, God is not to blame for their predicament because the gift 
was the same for every single one of them. Most religions today practice some kind of work-based deeds to make sure that God is pleased. This is the religion of Belshazzar and of millions today. Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, and Christians. They practice this kind of saving themselves with good actions. God rewards people not because they do good things, but because they're His people. Do you only give good things to your children when they do good things? Children? I should ask you. The only thing that brings about God's wrath is when you know something, you choose to ignore it, and you intentionally decide to oppose it. I, if I did that to my parents when I was young, I would get a licking. And I believe that when you choose to ignore it, when you know something and you intentionally decide to oppose it, that's what leaves you wanting and not measuring up. Because I believe that the story of this world is going to end and is going to end soon. And according to Romans 5, verse 17, the only difference between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar was that Nebuchadnezzar accepted God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. He looked up and he recognized that God had a plan for his life and that if he decided to raise him up or take him down, that was God's choice. He no longer needed to be king. And as such, Nebuchadnezzar measured up. And Jesus, God's son who died on the cross, is central to that plan. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And I've said this before. If you accept this now, your everlasting life starts now. It starts now. Even if you die, the Bible tells us that it's not going to hold you down. At the second coming of Jesus, you're going to fly out of that tomb like a banshee, like a hummingbird, like whatever you like that goes fast, like a Mustang. Nebuchadnezzar did not have the story of Jesus because he lived 630 years before Jesus. But we do. What we do with that story is the difference between just living here the way the world tells us to live or life eternal. See, God is going to make a new place. Go with me in the Bible. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21. This is the last book in the Bible. I wasn't going to do this, but let's just read it together. Revelation chapter 21, and we start at verse 1. God is going to make this place new. You can believe that or you can choose to not believe it. That's fine. But I'm just going to read it to you so you know. Revelation chapter 21, and we start our verse 1. It says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, who the one who's writing this book, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, there shall be no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. It's not about how you serve. It's about who you serve. There's a God, almighty, all-powerful, all-loving, who has done everything in his power for you not to be lost. For you not to be lost. I like this verse in 2 Peter chapter 3. It says, the Lord, and this is the New Living Translation, so maybe different than what you used to, but I like it. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. 
He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to measure up. But the day of the Lord will come as an unexpectedly as a thief. Why? Because most people aren't waiting for it. And he says, Then the heavens will pass away with the terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. By the way, for those who are listening, you may have heard me last week say that there is no hell. There is no place where people are burning right now. This is hell. This is a fire that's going to come down and just consume everything in an instant. And then we move on to this new earth and this new heaven that we read in Revelation 21. If a religion ever teaches you that God burns people for their sins, get out. It's not true. And it paints a picture of God that is not accurate. But God will judge. He will judge. There will be a time. That's why it says you only have two decisions you can make in your life. Whether you look up or whether you're going to keep going and be your own gods. So for Belshazzar, the writing was on the wall. <laughs> Literally. That's where we get the expression from. And by this time, it was too late. What about you? Has the writing been on the wall for you for a while? Have you given God the rightful place in your life? Is it time for you to say yes? And I've offered this every week, and I'm going to offer it again. If you want to get to know God, I have a team of people here who will be happy to spend the time with you once a week and help you know the God that they serve. And I can promise you that they're not going to judge you. They're not going to make you feel stupid because you don't know certain things. They're not. They are just like you. They are on a journey with God. You get to have a one-on-one -on -one with someone who will help you know who God is and what Jesus is, the Holy Spirit, all these things, all these words that religious people use that you don't know anything about, you're going to learn more about that because at the end of the day, you need to take ownership to know this God. Belshazzar didn't and Nebuchadnezzar did. So that's Daniel chapter 5. I've been amazed as I've been going through the book of Daniel how much the book is about salvation. Sometimes we've made it about something else. And there's other things there, trust me. Once we get to Daniel chapter 7, you better make sure you've got your armor on. It's going to get ugly. But we need to understand the central theme of the Bible and its salvation. And next week, we're going to tackle Daniel chapter 6, and we've entitled it The Last Stand. And it's going to be my friend, my brother in Christ, uh, Benton, who's going to share uh, this sermon with you. And I look forward to hearing another, another nugget of salvation from Daniel chapter 6. And I'm